Hi, I'm Gordon from Camera Labs, and this is my review of the Olympus 100-400mm f5-6.3, a mid-range telephoto zoom for the Micro Four Thirds system. Announced in August 2020, it will cost around £1,100, pounds, pitching it a little below the Panasonic Leica 100-400 f4-6.3. I didn't have a dollar price at the time that I made this video, but I provided a link in the pinned comment in the description below for you to check. Now Olympus went for a mid-range model as they already have budget telephoto zooms and have also teased the 150-400mm Pro lens with a brighter aperture and much higher price expected by the end of 2020. Since both lenses were already well underway at the time of the Olympus Imaging Division news, both should continue to go on sale as expected. Measuring 86mm in diameter and 206mm long, the Olympus 100-400 is actually a little wider and longer than the Panasonic Leica 100-400 and at 1.12kg the Olympus is also over 200g heavier and this is all despite having a dimmer aperture at the short end. This makes it one of the largest lenses in the Micro Four Thirds system, at least until the 150-400 Pro model arrives. Like the Leica, it takes 72mm filters. Coincidentally, when testing the Olympus lens, I had another 100-400 f5-6.3 in for review, the latest Sigma DGDN model for Sony E and Leica L mounts, which you can see here on the right, mounted on an A7R Mark III body. As you can see, the Sigma is roughly the same size and similar in weight too, although it's officially corrected for larger full-frame sensors and priced a little lower as well. That said, Sigma doesn't include a tripod foot with its lens, and the full-frame Sony body here is of course more expensive than the OMD EM1 Mark II on the left. As you all know, there's loads to weigh up between the two systems, but I just wanted to illustrate the physical similarities between these two lenses, even though the Olympus one will only be used with a smaller sensor system. Ultimately, both are 100-400mm f5-6.3 to lenses, regardless of what you put behind them. Viewed from the side, you can see the three main switches with a three position focus limiter, auto focus control, and a simple on or off for the optical stabilization, which, as a non SYNC IS lens, can be set independently from any body stabilization. In the middle is a wide zoom ring with a solid mechanism that extends the barrel in one section by 60mm. A locking switch on the opposite side can hold the zoom at 100mm, but not at any other focal length. Compare this to the Leica version which has a twistable ring to stiffen and essentially lock the zoom at any focal length. At the end of the Olympus barrel is a very smooth manual focusing ring, although as a more affordable model it lacks the pullback manual focus clutch mechanism of some pro lenses. It also lacks the built in extending lens hood of the Leica 100-400 or indeed Olympus's own 40-150 Pro, instead opting for a simple twist on accessory. Unlike the Sigma 100-400 I showed you a moment ago, Olympus has included a tripod collar and foot which allows you to rotate the barrel and camera, a sensible move considering the crop sensor effectively doubles the focal length to a maximum of 800mm. You can also remove the collar to save weight if preferred. The foot itself also employs an Arca Swiss dovetail allowing it to slide directly into compatible clamps, albeit not my Manfrotto one here. The optical construction consists of 21 elements in 15 groups with a 9 blade circular aperture system and a closest focusing distance of 1.3 meters throughout the range, although as I discovered in my test it will actually focus closer at the shorter end of the zoom and I'll demonstrate what you can use that for in just a moment. The most important specification of a lens is of course its focal length and when mounted on a Micro Four Thirds body, the Olympus 100-400 delivers coverage equivalent to 200-800mm. to 800 millimeter. Here's how it looks at 100 or 200mm equivalent and now at 400mm or 800 equivalent. Clearly this kind of reach is aimed at wildlife and sports photographers and I'll be showing how suitable it is for this later in the review. Oh and if you desire more reach still, the Olympus lens is also compatible with the Olympus teleconverters for a maximum equivalent focal length of 1600mm, albeit with a very dim aperture. Like many long telephoto lenses, the Olympus 100-400 is also quite useful for photographing small subjects at close range. Olympus quotes the closest focusing distance of 1.3 meters throughout the range, but set it to the 100mm focal length, I actually managed to focus down to 97 centimeters from the focal plane, which as you can see here delivered a subject 142mm wide. Meanwhile, at the 400mm focal length, I could focus 123 centimeters from the focal plane, which captures subject 56mm across the frame. Now this focusing distance and magnification makes it actually quite practical for photographing tiny subjects like insects without disturbing them or casting shadows, and here's a few uncropped images I took with the lens at 400mm on the EM1 Mark II. 
The optical performance is also very good at close range, as you can see when I zoom into one of these shots for a closer look. You can even see some detail on the eyes here. In terms of aperture, the Olympus 100-400 varies between f5 and f6.3. The maximum f5 aperture is available up to 123mm, at which point it reduces to f5.4 until 138mm. Then it's f5.6 until 150mm, f5.7 until 169mm, f5.8 until 186mm, f5.9 until 210mm, f6 until 236mm, f6.1 until 269mm, f6.2 until 300mm, and then the minimum f6.3 between 300 and 400 mil. Sorry if that was a bit boring, but I know there's a lot of people, including myself, who actually find this information really useful. In practice, here's the kind of bokeh blobs you can expect when shooting with the lens at 100mm from the closest focusing distance. First here at f5, then f5.6, f8, f11, and f16. In each case, the blobs remain mostly circular. Now for the lens set to 400mm, again from its closest focusing distance, where, like other 800mm equivalent lenses, the blobs become enormous. First here at f6.3, then closing to f8, then f11, and finally f16. Moving on to focusing, here's the Olympus 100-400 at 100mm f5 on an EM1 Mark II body, focusing between the bottle in the foreground and the bike gear in the background. It's focusing pretty swiftly and confidently here. Set to 400mm is unsurprisingly a great challenge at this kind of distance and contrast, but the lens and body combination still do a good job. I also tried the lens on the Panasonic Lumix G9 and found it focused quickly and confidently, albeit without the phase detection benefits of the EM1 Mark II. Next on to stabilisation, and as I mentioned earlier, the Olympus 100-400mm has its own optical stabilisation, but unlike some higher-end Olympus lenses, it doesn't have Sync IS. Apparently, this allows them to save costs. It's more expensive to manufacture Sync IS lenses. This also means it works independently of body stabilisation, allowing you to choose either or both technologies. So for comparison, I first recorded the view that you'll see at 400mm when composing with no stabilisation at all. And unsurprisingly for an 800mm equivalent focal length at close range, the image is very wobbly. Now for the same view, but with the lens optical stabilisation enabled, but the body stabilisation disabled. So this is just the lens optical stabilisation alone. As you can see, it's much more steady and allows you to more easily compose the shot as well as capturing it with less risk of shake. For comparison, here's the same view, but this time you're looking at sensor shift stabilisation, or IBIS from the camera only, with the lens optical stabilisation disabled. Now IBIS becomes less effective at longer focal lens, but I'd say it's still doing a great job here. And now for completeness, here's both IBIS and optical stabilisation turned on at the same time. Now again, since the lens doesn't have Sync IS, the two systems are unaware of each other, and may in fact conflict rather than enhance the performance. I'd say there's some evidence of this visible, although moments of superior performance. Which mode or combination is more effective depends on the situation and, in fact, the photographer. OK, now let's take a look at the image quality. First at 100mm f5 of a rooftop about 25 metres away. Taking a closer look towards the centre reveals a high degree of detail. And now, moving towards the corners, there's no loss of sharpness to mention. This was again taken at the shortest focal length and the maximum aperture. Closing the aperture slightly to f5.6 doesn't make a huge difference to the subject sharpness, although the depth of field will of course increase. Likewise, when close to f8, although beware as this is the smallest aperture you should use to avoid the effect of diffraction on this particular system, with the image visibly softening at f11, then more so at f16, and most of all at f22. Switching to the long end of the range, here's the lens at 400mm or 800mm equivalent, wide open at f6.3. Now, focusing at this kind of focal length becomes critical, especially if the subject isn't entirely parallel with the focal plane, so the very shallow depth of field will be responsible for some softness. That said, as I move out into the corners, the quality still looks pretty respectable wide open. Closing the aperture to f8, though, has broadened the depth of field and sharpened up the subject nicely, and at 11, there can still be some gains to enjoy here, so for the best results when fully zoomed in for this kind of subject, I'd shoot between f6.3 and f11, depending on how much depth of field you need. But again, closing beyond to f16 will incur softening from diffraction, and at f22, any of that original crispness has gone. A shallow depth of field can of course be your friend though when it comes to blurring a distracting background and concentrating on the subject. Here's one of Brighton Seagulls at 100mm f5 or 200mm equivalent, and if you zoom in on the picture you can see there's plenty of detail. 
At the other end of the scale, here's where you can get up 400mm f6.3. That's 800mm equivalent, remember, where the subject will, of course, entirely dominate the image. Again, taking a closer look reveals lots of fine details, but while the lens clearly works well for static portraits from a distance, how about when the subject's in motion? OK, so now for some birds in fly, all uncropped JPEGs direct from an OMD EM1 Mark II fitted with the Olympus 100-400 zoom. The focal lengths vary throughout the range of the pictures that I'm showing here, but the more distant ones were taken at the full 400mm and all were also at the maximum aperture of the lens. Now I experimented with different focusing modes, but generally opted for wide, zoned or even tracked areas and allowed the camera to follow the action. In terms of handling, it can be quite a challenge to swing around and aim an 800mm equivalent lens for birds in flight, so I personally felt most comfortable around midway through the range where the action was easier to follow. That said, the range is perfect for birds, and if your subject is more predictable, or you're simply better at this than I am, then there'll be little that's outside your reach. In terms of focus, I had a mixed bag depending on the mode I was using. I'd say around a 70% hit rate on the EM1 Mark II, although your mileage will vary depending on the mode, the subject, and of course your technique. Put it this way, it's certainly possible to use this lens for birds in flight on a higher end OMD body. Oh, and for all the Lumix owners out there, I also tried the lens on my G9 body and found it could also be a successful combination for birds in flight, even with the DFD focusing system of Panasonic. The focal range is also ideal for solar and lunar photography. Here's the setting sun at 100mm or 200 equivalent, and now at 400mm or 800 equivalent. As always, you have to be very careful when shooting directly into the sun, but when it's low in the sky and obscured by clouds, you can enjoy some dramatic results with this lens. And now for the young crescent moon hanging in the twilight sky at 100mm, before zooming in for a closer look at 400mm. Remember, all of these are uncropped images, so the long range gives you plenty of opportunity to get really close to distant or small subjects. And if you want to get closer still, it does, again, work with those Olympus teleconverters. Before wrapping up, a quick look at using the lens for video, starting with the optical range from 200 to 800mm equivalent. And while there's unsurprisingly some visible wobbles as I try and adjust the focal length, it's still fun to see the movements on the distant subjects at 800mm. Likewise, when the subject is tiny, like an insect. You saw earlier that the lens doubles as quite an effective macro performer, and that's equally useful when filming video. It's useful for wildlife portraits too. This one filmed at 100mm, f5 and handheld for a 200mm equivalent field of view. And returning to solar, here's what you can do with the lens at 800mm equivalent when hand-holding it using a combination of IBIS and optical stabilisation in the lens. Speaking of stabilisation, as promised, here's some video tests starting with unstabilised footage filmed with the lens zoomed into 400mm and of course looking very, very wobbly when handheld. Next, I've enabled optical stabilisation in the lens only and you can see the image become impressively steady. On this next clip, I've switched to the camera's body-based sensor stabilisation, or IBIS only. And finally, here's both IBIS and the optical stabilisation working together. So once again, which do you prefer? And now for a quick movie focus test, first at 100mm f5, where the lens and camera can successfully pull focus between subjects without hunting. Switching to the 400mm end is a bigger challenge, unsurprisingly given the fairly low contrast and very tight view, but the camera gets there in the end. And now here's the face tracking experiment, again, filmed at 100mm f5. Right, now that's out of the way, let's get on with my final verdict. The Olympus 100-400mm f5-6.3 to is a compelling super telephoto zoom for owners of micro four thirds bodies who want to get close to small or distant subjects. Previously, there was only one option for micro four thirds that reached this far, the Leica DG 100-400, but now the Olympus matches the range at a slightly lower price, albeit with a dimmer aperture at the short end. Olympus is also working on a higher end option with its 150 to 400mm Pro lens, boasting a constant f4.5 focal ratio and a built in 1.25x teleconverter, but that is a Pro lens with a much higher and as yet unconfirmed price tag. Either way, before 2020 there was only one native Micro Four Thirds lens that reached 400mm, and by the end of 2020 though, there should be three. The 200 to 800 millimeter equivalent range is perfect for wildlife, and in my test, the Olympus lens was certainly successful at capturing birds in flight when mounted on an EM1 Mark II or a Lumix G9 body. It's also ideal for grabbing dramatic close ups of the sun and the moon, even without a teleconverter, although again, it is compatible with them if you want even greater reach. As with many long zooms, one of the biggest surprises is how practical it can be for close ups of tiny subjects too, so your birding lens could also be your insect lens too. 
The biggest rival is of course the Panasonic Leica DG100 400mm which, depending on your region and any deals, costs roughly the same or a little more. The Leica sports a brighter f4 aperture at the 100mm end as well as a variable clutch that stiffens the zoom at any focal length, a neat built-in mini lens hood in addition to the main one and a cunning two-part tripod foot, plus it's actually a little smaller and lighter too. Now, I wasn't able to compare them side by side for this video, but in my previous review of the Leica lens at Cameralabs.com, the results certainly look pretty good. I'd say if the price is pretty similar, I'd go for the Leica for its brighter aperture and better feature set. But if your stores are selling the Olympus 100-400mm at a cheaper price, then it becomes an attractive alternative. Indeed, the most affordable way to reach 400mm with a native lens from the big two micro four thirds companies. If your budget is lower and you can sacrifice some reach though, there are several alternatives available that are much cheaper, including 100-300mm models at roughly half the price. As always, the beauty of the Micro Four Thirds system is the wealth of lenses available. Ultimately, Olympus has sensibly pitched its 100-400 and 150-400 on either side of the existing Leica DG100-400, providing Micro Four Thirds owners with even more choice at the super telephoto end. And I'm told both are sufficiently into their development and production not to be impacted by the recent Olympus statement. Right, that's it for another lens review. As always, if you find my work useful, you can support my channel with a like and a follow. And if you really like it, you can treat me to a coffee or treat yourself to my in-camera book where around half the photos were actually taken with Micro Four Thirds cameras. Let me know what you think of the lens in the comments. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.